And what of the photographs? What do they tell us? On three separate occasions, our office asked NASA's Public Relations Department for every single picture of an astronaut on the surface of the moon, just during the maiden voyage of Apollo 11. Many duplicates were sent. In all, fewer than 20 pictures were found, including first-hand investigation on site at the agency's vaulted archives. Quite surprising, considering the historical significance of the event. These very photographs are the same ones circulated year after year on anniversary commemorations. It is estimated that in just the first 60 minutes on the moon, motivated by the tenuous nature of the circumstances, many more exposures could have been expediently taken. Also surprising is the scarcity of photographs of the mission's chief pioneer, Neil Armstrong. The greatest achievement in human history and of the man whose first step echoed around the world dawning a new age of scientific enlightenment, there is only one full body picture of him on the moon besides this ghostly reflection. This one, taken by an automatic camera mounted on the side of the lunar module. Perhaps he feared liability should the whole conundrum later become unraveled. Perhaps he has forgotten that he attested to the authenticity of the event with his signature on this plaque engraved by the federal government. In fact, in the more than 30 years since the event, aside from NASA's initial press conference and the occasional brief anniversary remarks where few questions were permitted, he has never given one on-camera interview to anyone ever. From an analytical standpoint, photographic anomalies have to be sought out with an understanding of lighting and shadows. The most straightforward is simple. When objects are lit solely by the sun, as all the scenes on the moon were said to be, after all, lighting equipment was not only impractical, it was unnecessary in bright sunlight, then all shadows, regardless of the landscape, will run parallel with one another and never intersect, as shown by this example. In these seldom seen photographs, obtained from a rarely used auxiliary NASA archival site, it is clear that these scenes were lit with artificial light. These shadows, which are cast at different angles, are evidence that a second light source is being used. In addition, the sun would not cause an isolated hot spot like this, only an artificial light would. Again, intersecting shadows and another hot spot and again, and again. It is simply impossible for this picture to have been taken with sunlight on the moon. Here, the shadows are shown to be as black as pitch. And yet here, completely in a shadow, the astronaut is lit up like a Christmas tree. How can this be? Or this, on the shadow side of the lunar module. In this magnification of an Apollo photograph, a rock, very likely a paper mache prop because of the crease here, is categorized with the letter C. In later releases of the same picture, the letter is gone, probably airbrushed out. Here, a crosshair, which was burned directly into the image from the film plate, and thus should always appear on top of the objects in the photograph, appears behind the object in this scene clearly revealing a composite of two pictures into one. Someone apparently forgot to create a burn crater underneath the lunar module's 10,000 pound thrust engine, despite the fact that during ground tests there was a real concern for the vehicle falling into the hole the engine created as it descended. Here is a Norman Rockwell depiction drawn just two years earlier based on the latest specifications and scientific data. In these enlargements, it looks as though the lunar module was simply placed there, not even one speck of moon dust on the landing pod. As a result, all subsequent flights had to have the same discrepancy, which was explained away by the effect of no atmosphere. And what about stars? On the moon, with no atmosphere, they must have been quite a sight to behold. Yet there is seldom any mention of them, if ever, by any of the astronauts on any of the missions. Undoubtedly, creating a mural with all the constellations properly placed in the sky would have been virtually impossible to create accurately, much less realistically. A competent amateur astronomer would have been able to call attention to the slightest error in measurement. The answer? 
not to talk about the stars, ever. In their post-flight press conference, it was the only question to which Neil Armstrong responded with an absence of memory. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the sonar corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Years later, though, Michael Collins would remember seeing the elusive stars and wrote about them in Expeditions to the Moon. It seems his memory improved the older he got. Why don't stars appear in any of the photographs? Simply because the proper, mostly closed exposure setting for the camera's iris set that way to compensate for the bright sunlight on the moon's surface completely diminished the faintness of relatively distant specks of diminutive light. This answer is true. It does not, however, explain why they never took any pictures of the stars by themselves with an exposure setting perfect for them. While they took three automobiles to the moon, they never took a photographic telescope. Had they done so, they would have been able to see farther into the universe than had ever before been realized. If they had taken a telescope and were not actually on the moon, they would have had to concoct undiscovered galaxies that might one day prove to be non-existent. The cost of the three moon rovers in 21st century currency? Nearly 60 million dollars each though they had fewer parts than a jeep. Where was all this money going? Then there's the flag, blowing in the wind, at least twice, on the atmosphereless moon. We can only guess that most of the missions were staged inside for fear of possible aerial or satellite reconnaissance from an unfriendly nation. The backpacks, designed for one-sixth gravity, must have had the cooling systems removed to allow for movement without falling over. With very near and hot studio lighting, that left one hot astronaut inside. Assuming that it was the astronauts inside, after all, their faces were always covered. The necessary mammoth amounts of air conditioning were probably responsible for the air current. Here the editor cuts to a still shot of the flag, just as the effect becomes noticeable. Here it is unchecked. This rare clip, attained decades ago, was never re-released with the inevitable increase in experience and scrutiny. To demonstrate one-sixth gravity, a bouncy, floaty feel to the astronauts' movements would be similarly achieved with relative simplicity. Slow motion. You are viewing the scenes as they aired more than 30 years ago. Now let's look at them with the speed doubled. It becomes discernible that they are, in fact, in Earth's gravity and are no more leaving the ground than they would on Earth.